Hello, everyone. Welcome to our week two recording uh, about case-based learning. Case-based, as you well know, we're asking you to look uh, at the details of what's going on in um, uh, digital learning, uh, these terms of blended and online, which we will define for you in a little while. It, it allows students to uh, work in groups, to have conversations, uh, to ask questions of each other in regarding of this. Uh, we get active participation in groups, regardless of the age, whether they are older students or they are younger students. So it is, it is group dynamic uh, group work uh, that's here. We, we are looking at constructivists' ideas, and that is to combine prior learning with newly acquired knowledge, and that newly acquired knowledge could occur traditionally with students in rows, teachers talking to students, uh, teacher-directed learning to give students the basis uh, for the students to learn the facts of what they need to know and to allow them to combine that, those facts, with what they've experienced previously um, into, uh, into new knowledge. So we're not necessarily saying to you, just throw your, your classroom open to cases, let students figure out the basic ideas, and then uh, working, working into the problem. So we, we are really looking here, if we go back to, uh, to these ideas of um, working up our ladders of uh, knowledge comprehension application uh, and, and such, we are, we are looking at problem solving, we're looking at critical thinking. So we're, we're looking at sort of those top three levels here. Um, of the of this uh, of these stairs to get students beyond just giving us facts back. Although we may have to check for understanding if we are involved in in a learning that is teacher directed to get students uh, to get the basic knowledge, we're then asking them to take it higher, to analyze, to synthesize, and to evaluate uh, what what they are learning. Students also need some time for. We don't often say this for, for students, in particular younger students, about reflection. But it is opportunity for students then to step back individually and to consolidate that learning that's occurring within the groups, for them to perhaps reread something, rethink some ideas, uh, reconstruct uh, their thinking. We're, we're talking about some richer, deeper exploration of concepts. This could be through project work, time that you are taking in projects we could turn these questions towards cases. Instead of having students doing reports, going to the library or to the internet and copying information, they, they need some of that in the case, but we're talking about them analyzing it and digging deeper into these, um, into these concepts. So they are analyzing idea. They are applying concepts to solve problems. How did an organization solve a problem? How did a person solve a problem? How did a person? How did Henry Ford solve the issues of manufacturing cars? How is that different from the process that's used today? Compare that to Tesla and the battery car, and how that company is building cars compared to Henry Ford's case of building cars. The idea here is for students to interact with ideas, and notice how the teacher here is part of the conversation, but yet not part of the conversation. And of course, we're always interested in improving social skills and the student's cognitive skills as well. That student, that teacher is there uh, for purposes. So we are going to have to now look at the way that we evaluate this. We're going to have to develop um, not uh, tests, not multiple choice tests, but rather uh, rubrics and other means for us to pull out whether individual students, along with the groups of students, have found the relevant criteria, even gone beyond the relevant criteria, that we are asking for these students to reach. So we need to be writing some very strong performance standards, some clear objectives that we want students to reach, and some relevant criteria. So we just don't open this up. We, we need to have some basis of evaluation and, um, and uh, approving whether the student has learned the, the concepts, the ideas, the applications as we, as we need them to. So it's much, much different from a, a traditional paper and pencil test. So in these groups, it's typically three, four students along with a teacher. 
and the case-based experts say that these students need someplace else to work. Well, that's likely not going to happen much in our schools unless we have uh, spaces nearby where we can put students, but normally it's creating a station or a place they can pull desks together uh, for, for them to work. Within the course this week, there's a link to a, a teacher toolkit I would ask you to thumb through. Uh, it's in the section too, along with the readings and some videos that are there. Uh, it's, it's going to provide us some, the, the teacher toolkit may give you some insights um, about uh, what you would certainly need to provide for students in assessment, the, the framework for their learning, whether they need hardware and software uh, to, make, uh, to make that work for them. So the teacher toolkit is in the reading. Please, please, take, a look. Uh, please take a look at that. It's important for us to uh, it's important for us to have authentic situations for these students to explore. For example, the the Henry Ford, the, the car manufacturing uh, issue would be one that would be interesting to to take a look at. Things that are currently occurring in the news, such as Ebola. Um, how, what what are the issues of uh, solving uh, worldwide diseases? If we if we look back and have students compare polio with what's going on now and what might happen, some recommendations they might make to uh, solve uh, issues in, in world health. So all of these, in particular, authentic situations are, are now situations that could be com compared to previous solutions to those would be very, very helpful. Um, and we're, we're trying to get them to pull out difficult, complicated issues. Uh, current issues that are not solved are certainly ones that are incredibly complicated because the experts certainly have not solved them. Within the wiki um, is a, a flowchart, an implementation approach of how you may uh, want to look at case-based studies. Is, is case-based uh, worthwhile for, for you to do to devise activities and requirements? So this flowchart may give you some ideas of how to develop a case-based approach if you're going to actually apply that in your classroom or you're going to apply this for your you're going to apply this for your, your final project. So consider consider this and you, you may want to be considering even now whether you would want to use a case-based approach for uh, for your final project. Now you're as a teacher you, you play multiple roles um, in, in this setting. Uh, you're trying to construct a framework. You're trying to help them summarize. Uh, you're trying to give them assistance. You're trying to be a consultant. And if they have a need that perhaps you can help them with, uh, you, would, uh, you would do that. But most, of, most importantly, of course, that uh, the teacher plays the role of a teacher. And we should never forget that we are teachers. And from time to time, it is necessary for us to intervene. When students don't understand a concept, they have a concept completely wrong. And it is important for us to help, def help them get back on track um, as we need to. But we provide a whole variety of services to them. And one of them is being their teacher, to provide context. That's what we do. We provide context. We provide explanation. We provide examples when we need to. It may, may be necessary to sit knee to knee with a group when they don't have a concept and it's fundamental to the case and understanding and analyzing the case and getting them getting them on track. You, you set this environment. After all, it's not a, necessarily a free-for-all uh, of going off in a direction. There's certainly things that we want them to look at. We want them to address. We do set a framework for them. We set the framework for them with our um, with our uh, knowledge, we set the framework with them with our objectives, with the resources we give them, and we attempt as best we can to withhold comments and judgment. But as mentioned, we get in there if we need to. If the students are off course, we provide direction to help them out. We help them by sitting in and helping them summarize key issues with them. We help them put a summary together of what is of what is going on uh, within their case and what perhaps even what needs to be done. We help them with that process. We, we offer those resources, those technology resources. We offer our time. Uh, we offer perhaps or we suggest perhaps another expert who may be in the building who may be able to provide some help for them.
Here's like what I'd like for you to do now. I'd like for you to answer this question, and I would like for you to think about what uh, students, uh, what subjects that you work with, regardless of your grade level, whether it's primary or it's high school or in between, the subjects that might support case-based learning. And th this uh, sheet is within the course wiki. I would ask that you stop the recording, that you go there, and at the lower left is a slider and a control panel of the recording, that you stop this recording now, go to the wiki and make uh, answer this question. Next question, in this setting, how do you balance the role between teacher and facilitator, guide, teacher and guide, in a case-based setting? How do you balance that role? Again, again go to the, uh, that document uh, that's uh, in the course wiki, answer this question. Stop the recording now. With that answered, I'd like to move on to this idea of blended and online learning to try to help you with these definitions because they're not clear completely. The notion of the term of these terms, uh, is my first understanding of them has emerged uh, from the Sloan Consortium. Um, and this is where they introduced the idea of blended learning, the word blended learning, meaning that up to about 80% of the class is online uh, in a blended setting. Uh, online setting is one that is about um, over 80 percent that is in the is in the online setting. Web facilitated is up to about 30 percent. So from about 30 to about 80, uh, that is what uh, Sloan Consortium called blended learning. So we are sort of working in a blended setting according to what the so we meet three out of eight times. Uh, and that is a considered to be uh, considered to be blended. Uh, more recently, you may have been read, reading um, Horn and Staker, and Michael Horn has developed a new uh, definition. Uh, some of the, some of this occurs online, and some of this occurs in a school setting. So it's not necessarily completely out of class. So we have a, a blended setting according to according to him but the according to them the the idea that I w want you to know between the difference of our blended course and the course that he's talking about for children is different and this is the Clayton Christensen Institute uh, this is where Horn and Staker and, and Chris Christensen uh, published their work in regards to this uh, this whole blended learning continuum, which you are which you are reading about, uh, over here at number one, they talk about these rotation models, and all of you, I think, are familiar with the rotation model. Here's an example: the KIPP LA Academy, and uh, this is where we have stations. This typically happens in reading, where the teacher may be with a reading group, uh, and at another place, uh, students are working. It could be a station of some sort. And yet, add, there could be another stage, station. It could be seat work. But at this point, we would insert computers. And the computers are working with students. Uh, say, they might be doing reading, and uh, getting reading instruction there, or they might be getting some math instruction there. And if they're taking math instruction there, uh, they would be working at their own place. If these were second graders, we could have a second grader working on fifth grade math a second grader working on first grade math. These students are staying with their cohorts. They're not being pulled out. Could have a student who's still uh, working at the kindergarten level, but yet sitting side by side with a student who's advanced. So the students are staying in class. They're not being pulled out, but yet they're working on materials that are computerized, computer-based instruction, computer-aided instruction. These are the other terms for it. Student is there. The, the computer is recording. 
the student's progress, uh, recording test, uh, test assessment, formative assessment, and, and summative assessment about the student. And it's quite different from what we're doing here. We're, we, we are not recording necessarily every mouse click that you do, and we're not giving you little quizzes to test for your understanding. We're testing your understanding through teacher scored uh, work, whereas all of the work here would be scored by the computer uh, with, with math problems or with, uh, with reading uh, or such. And so students uh, may uh, rotate through all of these stations. In, in some settings called the individual rotation, th that's, that precocious second grader who's doing fifth grade math may, during, may, they may just sit there and work on uh, math the entire time and may never go to a teacher-instructed math setting. So there is teacher instruction that, that occurs. There's individual, perhaps this is where your collaborative activities, your, your inquiry-based learning, your other types of learning occur, and then the structured, individualized online instruction that's occurring, that's occurring here. Uh, that, that is really what I consider blended learning, and that computerized instruction is heavily uh, data-based meaning that it's collecting lots and lots of data about students. It is collecting how much time they're spending on each section. It's giving detailed analysis of uh, assessments, formative and summative assessments. It's measuring where there is mastery is occurring, where mastery is not occurring. And that, that's what's happening in those individualized settings. This, this, this online component here in these blended settings is what I consider really a blended model. We're really doing online, and I will, uh, an online in a different way. There's another setting, rocket ship education uses um, these settings where students rotate uh, actually between uh, between classrooms. And here, there's direct instruction in math with a teacher, direct instruction with literacy, social studies, a paraprofessionals in the learning lab doing reading and direct instruction from social studies. So there's a rotating, students are rotating between these four, uh, these four areas. So that is a lab rotation model. A, a flipped classroom, in a sense, uh, is blended learning, but not to the degree that uh, some want it to be. Uh, it's, it's usually teacher-prepared materials, teacher tracking, with computer-based instruction, with computer-aided instruction, where that computer and the systems behind it are collecting lots and lots and lots of data, uh, teachers do not have the ability, we don't have the ability to create those kinds of systems. These are systems that are typically purchased for the uh, true blended setting. Uh, and so they're commercially based. Our flipped classrooms are really uh, not, that, uh, not in that way at all. The, um, the, this back uh, back here to these uh, to these models in the flex model, um, and the flex model is where uh, we have a central learning lab. Students go in there, they go into this lab. Looks could look like a cube farm. Students work on their they work on their content. Today, a student could be just working all on math, or could they they could divide this up and I'm going to do some math, some social studies, and some language arts. Uh, and there are teachers there who help them within that setting. There are teachers who provide group instruction. There are teachers who provide intervention. Student may not be getting a math topic, has gone through it maybe two times or maybe a third time, and now it's time to get some knee-to-knee -knee instruction. Pull that student out of the central learning lab, send them to a place where a teacher can give them direct instruction, direct intervention in a very small setting. There could be a seminar. Again, over here where we're doing uh, uh, case-based study, inquiry-based instruction, uh, group projects, uh, it could spill out over into this part, and we have direct instruction going on as well. Uh, and those, uh, those settings look like this. You may have seen these pictures already in your reading, and where a student is, uh, has a computer station, a uh, student working here on a project. Uh, over here appears to be an adult helping another student. So we have a very large center space where students have their own place to learn, yet uh, they can go out and learn. Uh, they do go out and learn at different times and for different reasons. Uh, a student may get called out for a seminar. Mondays may go maybe seminar day, or there might be some direct instruction on, on, uh, on contemporary topics or application topics over over here in this corner. 
So this is a very, very large uh, setting. Uh, Carpe DM School in Yuma, Arizona. This might be one of your, uh, one of your studies. That is the flex model. The uh, other model that is here is referred to as the a la carte model. Uh, I think bef before a year ago, we all called this a supplemental setting. In this setting, a student uh, is a regular traditional student and third period or fourth period or whenever is assigned would go to a library or a lab with adult supervision and take that course that's not offered locally. Uh, could could be uh, an AP course um, in a school where the AP curriculum is not offered because of enrollment of students is low, but the student goes there. So uh, Horn calls this the a la carte model. Uh, it is uh, here. To, it was before it was known. Uh, we called it the supplemental model, and I still do because that would be the easiest way to explain this to a board of education. Uh, the enriched virtual model. Um, is the other one they talk about, and it's really a hybrid model. It's a, it's a model, it's a hybrid model where students, uh, high school students would spend part of their time in class and part of their time out of class. Initially, these, these schools started out as fully online, and the adults discovered that the students needed more uh, support from adults, and so they began to pull students uh, physically into, the, uh, into a school. So the students might be in school half time, three days one week, two days another week. And so they spend some time with adults and they spend some time on, um, they spend some time on their own learning. Uh, the online model is one that is pretty big in charter schools where students are fully online. And that happens in our program here too, where students take our courses fully online. And the only time that we would really see them uh, would be in a, in, at uh, orientation. Uh, before the starts and a graduation, unless we needed to meet with them for one reason. And some instructors do meet face to face, in particular, as we get near the final end of our course, students then do um, uh, meet with meet with faculty to talk about uh, to talk about these projects. Very briefly, some uh, some online blended learning. I, I remember when I was a, when I was a kid, uh, fifth grade, sixth grade, fourth grade. We uh, had these SRA reading boxes, so we would uh, we would go up to the box, and depending upon our reading level, we would uh, pull out a little folder. It looked like a Manila folder, except it had uh, uh, some reading on it and a quiz, and so. We would, depending upon our reading level, while the teacher was over working with a reading group, we would go up and uh, grab our you know, color that we were in, uh, read it, answer the questions, and then come back up and check our answers with the answer key. Well, this was always bound to have lots of cheating with it. You wouldn't read, read part of it. Teacher was over with another group. You could easily go up and look at the answers and not have to read, not have to read the section. But nonetheless, SR, the SRA reading boxes were one that was a way to help students personalize and uh, allow them to read at their own um, at their own grade at their own grade. I recall in college, our chemistry instructor had us go to the library. Uh, he used uh, some concepts called programmed instruction, where you had some audio tapes that you listened to, uh, and then some questions that you answered. You turned over the page, and the answers were there. And then you could go back if you didn't do so well. So programmed instruction is really the, the precursor to computer-based instruction and computer-aided instruction where there's some instruction on the computer. Student is supposed to participate in that instruction. Then there are some questions to answer. And then the computer responds whether those questions are correct and incorrect. And if they are at a, at a certain level, the student can, can move on to the next section. If not, student goes back and reviews and retakes the quiz again and again to the level that the teacher needs to intervene at that point. So that's programmed instruction. And it, it's, it's, it's been used for a long time. The military has used programmed instruction to train recruits. It's very, very effective, but it's not very boring. But yet we've put programmed instruction aside because it's not fun, but it is effective. In contemporary blended learning, some of you might be familiar with uh, Read 180. Read 180 is a blended learning 
uh, where there is, um, there is some whole group instruction by a teacher. Um, there is some small group instruction followed by some instructional software and some independent reading. So we, we get this whole group instruction here. We get a whole group wrap up at the end. And so this, this is blended learning in a, in a high school setting, a middle school setting, uh, secondary setting. This takes about two class periods to go through this, uh, to go through this process and, and we use it for, we use it for interventions. Uh, this is blended, this is blended learning. We also have uh, Lexia. Lexia is used, my experience has been used at elementary levels, and it too is a blended, uh, it is a blended learning uh, cycle where there is uh, some teacher-led instruction, some independent instruction, and then of course this data comes out of these instructional systems to tell the instructor where the student is, whether the student's progressing, um, and so the cycle continues. This, this is also blended learning. Blended learning has uh, come, to, come forward in the past decade uh, mainly as an instructional strategy for students who are struggling. Um, it's, it's there at the fringes for intervention is where Lexia and Read 180 have been, have been implemented. Our final question here is um, just tell us a little bit about your experience with online and blended learning as a student or teacher. So if you would stop the recording now and answer that question that's in the wiki. Finally then, there, take, take note of these definitions of online and blended. The real challenge for us is the, the, the notion of where blended learning is now. Blended learning means lots of things to lots of different people. Uh, I call our setting a hybrid setting. Uh, a, a, a setting that has highly based computerized instruction, lots of data behind it, that is what I refer to as the true blended setting because students can advance at their own rate they can move along at their own rate as opposed to the curriculum that we have balanced uh, for them. So we, we, I consider this a hybrid setting. Christensen and Horn, uh, Christensen, Horn, and Staker consider this blended learning. I think that we need to differentiate the terms further. I, I can't explain, I, I can't step up to a, a podium for a board of education and say we're doing blended learning without 10 minutes of explanation. If we can get some terms like supplemental, well, supplemental tells me this supplements the curriculum. A student goes to uh, a uh, computer at some time during the day uh, to, take, to take their additional material. That's pretty explanatory. But blended learning and then go down a whole list of what we're doing is really a challenge. And, and that, that's been my feedback to Staker and Horn uh, about what, uh, what this is. It's not clear enough yet to uh, give to a Board of Education without lots and lots of description that takes lots and lots of time. So case-based, the, the cases that we're asking you to look at are in regard to online and blended learning. Uh, and I look forward to talking with you this week and working with you uh, in this regard. Uh, please feel free to contact me, get a hold of me uh, as you need assistance, as you want to submit components for me to review to get some formative assessment. Uh, thanks much for being in the course. Thanks much for being here and we'll be talking to you very soon.